So I was saying, we were revising what we did last time and I was saying that there is a homework for you all. All these homeworks you need not submit, but please do them sincerely. Name three strategies for improving cooking, knowing about transport properties like heat transfer, mass transfer, things like that. And uh, if you read about molecular gastronomy, you'll get an idea about how far people are going in this field to improve food products. So that's the thing that I wanted you to talk about. And then after this, we started talking about continuum. And we decided that if there are enough molecules in a little parcel, like 30,000 or something, then that usually, I mean, it's good enough to make the assumption of continuum. And from now on, like today, we'll only be talking about those parcels. And we also talked about diffusivities. So like, what was the ranking in term who's faster than who? Momentum is fast, fastest, then, then, then thermal and then mass. So we uh, discussed why this kind of hierarchy goes. We also talked about dynamical similarity where we, uh, thanks Siddharth, um, dynamical similarity where we uh, uh, discussed the Buckingham Pi theorem and we uh, uh, talked about how I can design like an experiment which runs in water, which is going to be representing something else in air and various such things like how we can design. So this uh, dynamical similarity and non-dimensional numbers like what it buys us, we saw that, right? And then we started talking about the laminar turbulent transition. And we said, you know, there is a basin boundary of attractors in the regime where there are both laminar attractors and turbulent attractors. So if the flow can be either laminar or turbulent, there's a big regime in which it can be either laminar or turbulent and where it goes depends on the initial conditions. And we talked about what is a turbulent attractor, this horrendous mess, which was an attractor itself. And in that attractor, like uh, how it visits periodic orbits for a lot of its life. It visits one periodic orbit after another. And these periodic orbits have nice shapes and patterns. They come and go, but they have beautiful patterns and things. So it's not like white noise. So this is where we stopped. Any questions from last time you need to ask to continue for today? Uh, that's a very good question. Like sometimes we do miss things. Like yesterday I brushed many things under the carpet. There was no carpet, but I brushed many things. So uh, the, the for example, I uh, didn't talk about the Mach number. The Mach number, which is so it's very important for an aircraft how far away its velocity is from the speed of sound. So the speed of sound was a variable which we didn't take into account. Yeah, then we will assume that our uh, plane is going slow and stuff. Correct. Whereas a big passenger aircraft doesn't go slow. It goes at a mark of 0 0.7. Fighter aircraft crosses the speed of sound. So yeah, like we, we can never be very sure. We just have to think a lot and decide what all is important. So yeah, it only has to come from experience. It's a bit of voodoo art. Yeah. So, okay. So today we'll start with the Lagrangian derivative. We, yes. Yes, Anu. So you're saying if I was sitting in white noise, what would I see? If I was sitting in white noise, I wouldn't see any attractor. It would just be randomly jittering about zero. So like there won't be any path it will follow or any, first of all, it won't be obeying a simple equation. It's delta correlated in time. So like these are all, all these dynamical systems, they are very smooth, continuous. So there are preconditions on the velocity and on the field before we can make these, um, you know, uh, basin boundaries and attractors and things like that. There are many assumptions we've made on the smoothness and the continuity of these functions, which we uh, in normal fluid make, it is true, but in white noise, even that is not true. So I wouldn't be able to do anything for white noise. So the very fact that there are all these things happening shows that it has character. 
it's not just a characterless um, you know random motion anything else okay so let's start with the lagrangian derivative Like Correct. So we will be deriving the Navier-Stokes equation and it is a solution for the velocity vector. And uh, if we are given a flow, like we told the geometry, we told things, then like uh, the, the solution of the Navier-Stokes with the right boundary conditions and initial conditions will tell us about the velocity vector. And uh, don't ever like underestimate the effect of geometry. Geometry is very, very crucial. Like we were talking about a plane, like a small change in its wing shape and it won't fly. So geometry is crucial in, um, so the fluid solid interaction and the boundary conditions are very, very fundamental. Okay, let's talk about the Lagrangian derivative. So there are two kinds of derivatives. One of them we call Eulerian and the other we call Lagrangian. And the Eulerian, it's a time derivative we are discussing here. It's usually del by del t. So we have all our equations are partial differential equations because our flow depends on space and time, three space components and time. So we have four independent variables typically. And in this, we are writing partial differential equations. And uh, if I just take the derivative with respect to time while holding space fixed, then that's the Eulerian derivative. We'll talk soon about the Lagrangian derivative. So what it is, is basically the following. Like you can imagine a river flowing and you're putting one sensor in the river. So like suppose a river is flowing from a mountain to the valley or something like that. And it's starting from, let's say, the Himalayas. So it's very, very cold here and it's cold water which is coming down. So then like uh, what's happening is that, uh, so if I put a probe here and I keep measuring the velocity here, so that's like an Eulerian measurement. Like I'm sitting in place A and I'm just asking what's the river velocity or river temperature or composition, everything in that place. The Lagrangian one is... For example, I take a packet here of the river and I color it with something and I keep following that object. I keep following that object and ask what is its temperature, concentration, everything as it goes down. So that's effectively the Lagrangian derivative. So how will we derive the Lagrangian derivative? So let us take, uh, let us take a parcel which is now at x and t. And after some time it has reached x plus delta x and by which time the time is t plus delta t. So it went there. Okay. So how do I get the derivative of this? So like, let me say I want to measure some function here. The function could be temperature, velocity, concentration of some red ink that I put in it, whatever I like. So I have like all kinds of functions. So what would be, so now I want to ask, how did that function change? For example, how did this guy's water, this water's temperature change when it came down? So I could be measuring the temperature. So how do I do that? So like I can just Taylor expand, right? So I will write F of X plus Delta X T plus Delta T equal to F of x comma t plus what do you want me to add del f over del x into delta x plus yes bit down okay del f over delta is this enough is this enough okay del f by del t into delta t plus higher order terms, right? This is what I'd write. And now I want to ask what's the time derivative of this, right? So what am I trying to find? I'm trying to find f of x plus delta x comma t plus delta t 
minus f of x comma t by delta t. And I'm doing this in one dimension, but x is a vector, okay? X is a vector. So there'll be three of these that I'll be writing down. Okay? It'll be a vector I'm dotting there. So if I write it like this, I will divide all this by delta t. So del f by del t plus delta x by delta t, del f by del x. And it's a dot product because I'm taking the same x, same component. So basically, this is my Lagrangian derivative cap D. Uh, cap D, we'll call it small d because cap D we use for diffusivity. Okay. So small d by dt of anything is equal to del by del t plus u dot grad that thing. Is this okay? Or uh, let me call it d by dt. Sorry for changing my mind on notation. That's terrible. And we'll call diffusivity with a curly d or something. Okay, because we're going to, I mean, this is more standard notation. So this is my Lagrangian derivative. Shall we now derive the equation of continuity? Yes. Yes. It, for, it implies that we're following the same set of molecules. It's like a cricket ball. When I ask about the velocity of a cricket ball, I can't do Eulerian derivative because if I stand here and measure the velocity, the ball is gone. I have to move with it and ask what is its velocity. So that's the d by dt is just the velocity of the cricket ball. So it's like, it's the same molecules. It's the same packet, which I'm following. And this is actually important. Even in the continuity equation, it's going to become important. So yeah, uh, the equation of continuity basically is about conservation of mass. All our equations are about some conservation. And this is going to be the conservation of the total mass. Like we're not asking if this packet of fluid contains salt water, fresh water, what it contains. It can be some general thing with a general density, which is made up of everything it contains. So we're going to ask about that thing and how it is conserved. So when we ask about each component, like let's say oil and water separate, then we have to write separate equations for that. Whereas now we are asking about the general object. Okay, so let's do this. Let me. What? No, no. The point is the following. It's like, like at this point X, if I'm keeping a probe and I'm measuring the temperature, suppose there was warm water all along. I'm measuring warm, warm, warm. And then this is a packet of cold water which has come suddenly from the mountain. I'm going to measure cold. So like everything is a function of both x and time. It's just whose property are you measuring? Are you measuring a property of a place or are you measuring the property of a given blob? Got it? Okay. So now in, uh, in continuity, we start with a cube, let's say a little cube. And it's got delta x, delta y, delta z. That's not right-handed, right? How do I fix it? Replace x and z. Replace x and z, okay. Will it work then? Yeah, x, y, z, yeah. It's fine. Okay, so this is my little volume and a bunch of fluid is flowing through. In fact, like we're going to be coming up with this example. So I'll draw the example first. Here's a tap and here's some fluid coming out of it, water coming out of it. So this is in laminar flow. It's this, this is the example we're going to come to, but we're going to take a little tiny little volume inside it and we're going to write continuity for it. Okay, so now what happens if there's a fixed volume in space? Right now we're fixing a volume in space 
and we are asking about mass conservation. So what can happen to mass? Like, I mean, if I'm looking at, let's say, a metro train from above, and if N people are getting in and M people are getting out, that means N minus M people are still there who got in, right? So it's as simple as that. So it's basically in minus out equal to accumulation. Okay, and this is going to be different when we talk about temperature and concentration and other things. For example, like uh, if I have a candle in the flow, and let's say I put a candle here, then my heat equation cannot be in minus out equal to accumulation. It has to be in minus out equal to in minus out plus source plus heat input is equal to accumulation. So it's not just things coming in and out, but it's also got source terms. So yeah, the mass, typically we don't write it with the source term, but there are special cases where we do, which I won't go into now. So in minus out is accumulation. So what's coming in at this phase? How much will come in at this phase in a time delta t? So suppose the fluid is flowing this way. This amount of fluid is coming into that phase, into the box, in a time delta t. And how, what is the length of this? Hmm? What? Yeah, so u, let's call it uv and w, so u delta t. So a volume of u delta t times the surface area is coming in. So I have u delta t, u at x, this is x, x plus delta x, u at x delta t times delta y delta z. And what's going out is the u at this place times delta t minus u at x plus delta x delta y delta z. And let's write the other two things. If anyone has a question, stop me. So v at y delta t delta x delta z. And just tell me if I'm writing it correct. V of y plus delta y x plus delta x, already I made a mistake, delta x, delta z, plus w at z, delta t, delta x, delta y, minus w at z plus delta z, delta x, delta y. All of this is what? In minus out, right? And that should be equal to how much? Wait, wait, you all didn't tell me that the mass coming in is rho times the volume. Rho times the volume is coming in. It's not just the volume coming in. Rho being the density, we defined it yesterday, right? Is this okay now? Any complaints? Huh? What? We not, right now we didn't say whether it's, yeah. You're right, like you were thinking incompressible and you were okay with it, but it's not incompressible. We are deriving the continuity equation. Yes, yes. So that's just the mass leaving and mass coming in. Mass coming in is that density multiplied by that volume coming in. So that's what it is, okay? So like after this, we'll go to incompressible. I was also like thinking incompressible and writing it. So that wasn't correct. After this, we'll go to incompressible, but we'll derive this for compressible. And what is accumulated inside? Yeah, so rho delta x, delta y, delta z, at time t plus delta t, minus the same quantity at time t, correct? So like whatever was already there, you can't count it. You have to only count the amount that came in. Now I can divide throughout by delta x, delta y, delta z, and take the limit of all of them going to zero, delta x, delta y, delta z, and delta t. So then what am I going to get? I'm going to get minus d by dx of rho u, dou by dou x of rho u, agreed? 
Yeah? You're looking worried? Minus dou by dou x of rho u minus dou by dou y of rho v minus dou by dou z of rho w equal to dou by dou t of rho. Yes? Yeah, like if I divide by delta x, delta y, delta z, I'll get a 1 by delta x here, right? So that will give me a derivative. Got that, no? Yeah, so this is my continuity equation. I can write it a little better in shorthand. I could write dou rho by dou t plus del dot rho u equal to 0. Yeah? It's the little density inside that little volume. It's the average density inside that little volume. Yeah, even in the little volume, there may be variations, but we're not considering that. So this is my equation. I can expand it out into something here. Let's do that here. So I had there dou rho by dou t plus del dot rho u equal to zero. I'm going to write it as dou rho by dou t plus I'm going to expand out the del dot. So what will I get? U dot grad rho plus rho del dot u equal to zero. I've just expanded out the term there. Okay. And do you recognize this thing? What is it? Hmm? Lagrangian derivative. So yeah, we've in fact written it here. So this is now d rho by dt plus rho del dot u equal to zero. Okay. And we are going to be talking incompressible flow, which means the density is a constant for us. To tell the truth, no density is absolutely constant. But usually what happens, and you can show this rigorously, um, when the um, flow speed is way, way, way less than the speed of sound in that medium, then you can approximate the density to be a constant. You're doing fairly well calling the density a constant. Okay, now we are going to talk about flows which where the temperature changes, the concentration changes. And we yesterday also we talked about that uh, double diffusive convection, right? There were small changes in density there. But the thing is, those density changes are so very small that they're not going to affect this balance. Like to a very great approximation, you can say del dot u is zero. This depends only on the speed of sound, not on those things. So for example, for example, if I have a mixture of oil and water, so it's important to get this thing straight. So if I have a mixture of oil and water, oil is less dense. Water is more dense. Okay, so suppose I had a box here. Okay, let's take this bottle. I've got water inside. Now I start putting oil from this end. And so the water is going to ooze out, right? Because del dot U is zero. So if incompressible, del dot U is zero. So like if I start putting oil here, it's going to ooze out. And after a while, I'm left with a lighter bottle because I've got only oil in it. So it's not that my density didn't change, but because my del dot u was zero, my d rho by dt was zero. So it's not that I didn't have a density change. The d rho by dt is zero, so the, the, the density of water went out with the water and the density of oil came in with the oil. So I changed the density in this bottle because uh, by maintaining the Lagrangian derivative. So obviously if I move with water, its density doesn't change. If I move with oil, its density doesn't change. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes. Okay, so I am unable to do that exercise right now, but you can show it rigorously because the pressure grade, pressure differences that these density differences cause. For example, in an ideal gas, if I know the density differences, I can write the pressure differences. 
and those pressure differences will be compared to the speed of sound. Like you can write on their expansivity and compare it to the speed of sound. I'm not able to do a rigorous derivation and the half-baked derivation leads to further questions. So I would advise like whoever is interested to read about it. And later they can write to me if they have further questions. But right now, just accept that. Um, okay, so sound is like molecules are going in this direction, right? It's a longitudinal wave that's being transmitted. Everything is incredibly fast in that direction. When you move, I mean, something is just shaking and that information goes at the speed of sound. But these density changes, they're going with the speed of the flow. Which unless I'm in a supersonic aircraft or in a space shuttle, I need not worry about. And in those cases, we do worry about them. We do not write del dot u is zero. References on this. I think the references I gave last time will deal with it. Critton and Faber, all of those will deal with this in some sense. And I'm pretty sure Bachelor might. And there's a question to explain it again, the oil and water scenario. Okay, okay. So in the oil and water, speed of sound is 1.5 kilometers per second. Nothing here is going at 1.5 kilometers per second. Okay, like it's like incredibly slow compared to that. So we're going to say del dot u is zero to a fairly good approximation. So what does del dot u equal to zero mean? And if I'm pumping oil at this end and taking out water at this end, it's going to be that if I move with the water, its density can't change. If I move with the oil, it will always have oil car density. And there'll be an interface which is slowly moving out. It's pushing the oil out, what? right? Water out, sorry. It's pushing the water out and it's pushing the oil in. So now and at the end, I'm getting a lighter bottle because it's now filled with oil. So it's not that the density was constant, but the D rho by DT was zero. So continuity is still being obeyed. That's the part I'm trying to tell. Okay. Okay, so this is the equation of continuity. Let's work out this quick example. So in minus out is accumulation and we were following this object. So suppose I'm following this object and without knowing the Navier-Stokes equation, I can actually derive for you the shape of this thing, the shape of the water coming down. So like if you have a nice tap at home where they've not put some funny dispenser or something, like just um, take a picture and uh, draw the radius as a function of Z. So like suppose I'm measuring Z from down here, just measure the radius as a function of Z. This is a simple, very simple fluid mech question you can answer for yourself, just using continuity and yeah, some knowledge of dynamics we're going to use. So like now I've got this yellow blob. This yellow blob was at height Z1 at time T1. And yellow blob was at time Z2 at time T2. Okay, so we moved with the yellow blob. And we are going to ask like uh, what, uh, we'll come back to this thing, but we're going to ask how did this thin down? And we know something like if you're moving with the blob, so I can write D, dv by dt of the yellow blob is equal to what? What is acting on this tap? Gravity, right? So dv by dt, I can write equal to g. Okay. And I'm keeping this tap on forever. It's going on and on. It's in steady flow. So what do I write for dv by dt now? Nothing is, there, there's no, dv by dt is this, right? Dou by dou t plus u dot grad. Is there dou by dou t? No, because nothing is changing if I sit in one place and measure. It's the same velocity all the time. I'm wasting water. I'm keeping this running. Got it? So what is the only term in d by dt left for me? u dot grad. And here's where the global continuity also comes in, which is why I chose this example. So like now with dv by dt zero, I've got v, sorry, w, uh, dw by dz equal to gravity. It's too high. What? White chalk. 
डब्ल्यू डी डब्ल्यू बाई डी जेड इक्वल टू जी अग्री और डिस अग्री अग्री एंड दिस इज समेज वेलॉसिटी इन दट प्लेस एवरेज वेलॉसिटी इन दट प्लेस आई शुड कॉल दिस डब्ल्यू सो एवरेज वेलॉसिटी इन दिस प्लेस एंड वॉट सो आई एम जस्ट अस्यूमिंग दट दिलॉसिटी इज द सेम विच मे ओ मे नॉट बी ट्रू बट इट्स नॉट नॉट अ बैड अप्रोक्सीमेशन सो लाइक What's the total amount of fluid coming here? It's W times pi r squared, pi r one squared. Let me call it. Agreed? And that's the uh, uh, volumetric flow rate uh, uh, for a little time delta t. And what is going out? Ah, oh, so actually, I don't even need that. I've got this. I've got my dW by dz equal to g, and I know that w pi r square is a constant. So w one pi r one square equal to w two pi r two square. Okay, and I know the dW by dz, which I can solve for. What do I get? I get half w square equal to g z plus a constant. If I just integrate that, and uh, and and at this place, let me say I know the W. So it's W zero at Z zero. Agreed. So what is C going to be? Z is measured downwards. What is C? Anybody? Half W not square. Okay, so now all what do, what did we want to do? We wanted to get the radius as a function of z, right? Of this thing that we were opening, and now we know z in terms of w's, and we know radius in terms of w's. So I can remove w and write this in terms of z's. So like, what will I get? Let me just copy down the final answer, which you can copy for yourself. I mean, you can work out for yourself. Okay, brilliant. I didn't even work it out. So I'll write it now. Okay, so uh, this we know. So we can write now um, W is equal to W zero into R zero square by R square. That's what I'm getting from here, right? so i just replace it here so i get half w0 square r0 to the power 4 by r to the power 4 equal to g z plus half w0 square so i've got the answer i wanted in fact it's going as r to the power z to the power 1/4 so that's how this thing is changing so this is a simple experiment you can do at home just take the tap get the uh, radius all you need is a picture nice picture in your camera and then measure the radius as a function of z and see if it's obeying this 1/4 kind of law okay so this is a nice thing you can solve just knowing continuity equation yes Is not the water flow. Yeah. So, will we be able to? Will we have to apply some kind of calculations? Very good question. We should not do this in turbulence. We we should just gently open it till it very nice, you know, transparent stream comes there. That will be laminar. If you do it in turbulence, you cannot write this with just the. I mean, right now I am not worried about what it loses. yesterday we talked about turbulent losing a lot of energy right like by walking backwards forwards and all so if we do that like the the it's going to lose a lot and we cannot write this it won't uh, you know uh, speed up in the same way why will that equation be holds for that equation holds for everything that equation holds for everything but this equation that we wrote down will not hold this equation that we wrote down will not hold 
because continuity holds for everything. This has other friction forces acting on it. We pretended that there is only gravity acting on it, which is not true. So, like we've actually neglected the air drag that will uh, in this. When we wrote, we've neglected the air drag. So we've said average velocity is a good enough measure, but actually the air will be dragging the water back. So you'll get some profile. That's point one, which we've neglected. But uh, the turbulent profile will be even more different. It will lose more. So you have to write other forces, like viscous forces here. So it won't be easy. It will be a royal mess. So thanks for that very good question. So I should have clarified right in the beginning that it's laminar. OK, any questions on continuity? Yes. Sometimes which comes up. What? Prints on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. So is that because of the air drag or is that. Something? So it's a combination of things. So basically, what Jitender is saying is you might see it something like this, correct? Correct? That's what you're referring to. And that's because, like, you know, it is uh, hitting a bottom wall. I was writing this pretending there's no bottom wall. So if it hits a bottom wall, there'll be a pressure which will go backwards and you could get instabilities which can you know, grow into some amplitude and sustain themselves. So it's a much more complicated thing. In fact, like now that you bring this up, we can do some beautiful experiments where like uh, instead of a round hole, you take a more viscous fluid so that it becomes easy to do the experiment and you take just a big jar and you punch different types of holes in the bottom. So suppose you punch like a rectangular hole and then you'll get a ribbon and that ribbon will twist around and that has nothing to do with the bottom wall. It's its own instability. And as you change the aspect ratio and all, you can see like different wavelengths. It will beautifully, uh, you know, uh, do this helical behavior. So, yeah, it's a nice model for your DNA molecule. And would I follow the same law because for changing the uh, area of the first part again, how would you determine whether it will uh, narrow down or spread up? So, like, whatever you do, it will narrow down. And would it follow the same path? So, like, yeah, I mean, uh, to a great extent, it will follow this thing, but it will not be radially symmetric. So, I have to write the right. Thing. So, like the A by B ratio should remain the same and it should come down. So, that will be happening on one side. But then, like this whole solution, I told you, like Navier Stokes can support different solutions. That solution itself will become unstable. So, we talked about when a particular flow will attract and when it will repel, right? Now, the beauty is this flow is not becoming turbulent. So, turbulence is not the only way it will go unstable. So, it will just be a ribbon like doing this it will be it will reach a periodic state it will reach a new periodic state which is like helical so every fluid particle is doing a helical uh, march downwards it has nothing to do with the dissipative terms these are just instability of the Euler equation um i can't remember that part i uh, did the instability once but i've forgotten that part but you can try it I think it should be an instability of the oiler. That's my gut feeling. But try it. Mm. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, like, that's a very good point. If I keep uh, pushing this wall down, after some time, this won't happen. It will be very clean. Good point. Mm. Hmm. The first one is when following the same law, the shape could change, hence dx dy dz in the derivation would change. But this shape change never appeared in the derivation. Yeah, so like I indirectly said this, like in a laminar flow, there's no reason for the shape to change. Like if it was circular to start with, it will continue circular because it's symmetric. There's no force pushing at, in any particular direction to change that symmetry. So that symmetry will be obeyed, but in turbulent flow, all the symmetries are off. 
So instantaneously it will change. But on an average, even in turbulence, it will still be axisymmetry. There will be no theta dependence on an average because nothing is there to bring the theta dependence. Uh, the second question is, as R is changing, would there be any density of pressure changes in the flow? As R is changing. Yeah, like uh, basically inside this flow, there's no density change. And right now we're pretending it's incompressible. So take it as density never changes. And pressure, of course, like, you know, it's high pressure here, low pressure here. That's why it's flowing or it's or it could be the same. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's atmospheric pressure here, atmospheric pressure here, except that just inside the tap, it's at high pressure. It's being pumped from up. But uh, once it's outside, the pressure is the same. It's atmospheric pressure everywhere. Uh, third question is, how do we understand the formation of vortices? We'll come to vortices in the next class. So tell that person attend on Tuesday. And there is another <laughs> question during the time you were answering. Huh. As the water from the tap keeps falling down, the water is accelerated by the force of gravity. Yes. So if the velocity of the fluid reaches the verge of turbulence, how is the equation going to hold true? Very good question. So like it could be that the velocity is so very big here. And, uh, but wait, but wait. The w, uh, w r square is a constant. And Reynolds number is w r by nu, right? If W R square is a constant and uh, W is increasing, R has to be decreasing, right? The Reynolds number is decreasing or what? Have I got it wrong? Can somebody tell me? So the Reynolds number is this, W times R by nu. And W is proportional to one over R square. So it is increasing. It's like, uh, something over r square r yeah then 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 you're right like it can easily go to turbulence i should have answered that intuitively like definitely it will go to turbulence if you let it go forever and ever regarding that there's another question mm. saying as r is decreasing uh, shouldn't it go to zero after some time well, when it starts becoming extremely small, then like uh, other things will happen, like viscous forces will come in before that and you'll start getting a profile. But yeah, I mean, theoretically, if you're going on forever, it has to reach an infinite speed and yeah, but uh, well before that, like uh, the air drag effects will come in and it will finally reach a steady state. It will reach a terminal velocity because of air drag. So if the flow is slow, then it forms droplets. If it's fast, then for a great distance, it doesn't form droplets. So like that's another instability, depending on how big the surface tension effects are. So if you have something pretty mota, it will not uh, form droplets. But if you have a smaller flow rate, and this thing is already small R to start with, then indeed it will break into droplets. So it depends on whether the uh, surface energy can uh, overcome this thing. Like if there's a, uh, in other words, it depends on whether a cylinder's area is lesser or greater than the droplet ka area. Yeah, I've just neglected them. But yeah, you need to do that. And this can become a very much more complicated problem. In fact, like if it hits the ground, like some very nice things can happen. And you can get these hydraulic jumps, which are not part of this course, but you can just open the tap in the sink and see the jump. So yeah, like this simple tap problem is very, very interesting. And in fact, I wanted a period doubling route to chaos experiment in this tap thing. I don't know whether it's easy to set up. Let's see if we can set it up by next Thursday. Z as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we can we can ask at which hour will the flow become turbulent, and we can ask at which hour the air drag becomes important, because as you become thinner, the you know the area is big compared to your volume. So yeah, we can ask all those things and put limits. Yes. 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 I mean, this is just the simplest thing we can do by just knowing continuity. And this, I mean, it just gives me a nice one-fourth law. But the beauty is that you do an experiment, you'll get it. 
Like if you do a careful experiment, you can neatly plot it. So it's valid for quite some distance. So most of our taps, we don't have like that kind of height, right? So we don't reach those strange places. Plus some turbulence terms and the considering turbulence. So when you're going from that to WB, WYB side, the RHS also will include the turbulence terms, right? Yes. Yes. No, 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 no. Sorry. This equation is only valid for laminar. This equation is valid for both laminar and turbulence. Continuity equation is always valid. Because like, I don't care whether it's laminar or turbulent. I've made like who comes in and who goes out. I've made an accounting of who came in and who went out. And that doesn't care about. Um, I should have said that clearly. So sorry. Huh. Uh, second equation on the top. Yeah. Yes. So that, will include the that should include extra terms. Quite right. But uh, in the structure, we discussed that the muscular weight of uh, laminar flow is higher than muscular weight. For a given pressure gradient. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's say I do have both the scenarios in the same. Uh, mm. How would you copy that? Would you be having to add those terms in the continuity equation? Or? The continuity equation is always valid. Okay. The, the Navier-Stokes uh, tells you what the drag is or the pressure drop is. So whenever I talk like for a given pressure drop, what's my flow rate? I'm already talking dynamics. I'm talking forcing and that's giving this. Whereas the continuity equation doesn't care about all that. It's just an accounting of a little volume in space who came in, who went out, finished. So no dynamics in it. Okay, now when I consider dynamics, indeed, if it is partly laminar and partly turbulent, I have to add those drags separately and you know, it, it, like usually a linear combination is enough for me to get the answer. More questions? Okay, shall we stop for five minutes? Okay, so... Uh, before we let the others join and they'll get it, it's not very problematic. So the um, just like we derived the continuity, we're now going to derive the heat transport equation because that's easier than the Navier-Stokes. And then I'll write the Navier-Stokes in a similar way to the heat transport, giving you an idea about how I'm doing it. So we're going to consider the exact same problem as before of this thing coming down, this water thing coming down. Except, uh, sorry, wait, I have to draw it differently. It's no longer water, like it's coffee. So it's pouring out of this glass and reaching this. Okay. So like, does heat transfer take place in this situation? Hmm? Convective? Do you know it's convective? If I put turbulence, yes. But what if I gently put a small... Hey, by the way, we don't even need this ribbon thing. Even in the coffee, you can see those instabilities. You can see the whole thing roll up into a helical instability. What? Irregularities in the surface area. It could be, but I think it's something more fundamental. Like even if you put a round one, you're going to get instabilities. Yeah, in this case, it could be aided by those things because anytime you have an irregularity that kicks in the, I mean, if it, if it somehow can kick in the right wavelength instability, you'll see it manifested, but there has to be something slightly more fundamental in that thing itself to give that instability. So that's basically the thing. So now we're pouring this and have you seen like people who pour it like from a great height? What's the whole idea? To make a froth, I guess. Also to cool it, right? So it actually cools down as you go down. So we're going to look at that. So it's the exact same yellow blob we're going to consider when it went from here to here. 
z1 to z2 at time t and time t plus delta t at time t1 and time t2 okay and we are walking along with the yellow blob so wherever it is at z we are going to walk along with it and we are going to write the heat transfer equation so when i am moving along with it what happens so here is my yellow q which i have drawn in white for the online people and what was it delta x delta y delta z delta y so this is my uh, thing wait wait i can't do that sorry this is delta z so what are these delta y and delta x yeah delta x and delta y okay great so this is now my uh, yellow cube falling down i'm going with it and at any given time it's at height z okay and uh, what is the heat transfer in and heat transfer out conduction now so like what how is it conducting on all sides so what is the heat transfer coming into this surface what's the heat flux hmm what does it depend on like when does heat flow temperature gradient exactly so it is dt by dz at z times kappa correct with a minus sign agreed yeah so this is going to be that and that's going to be the same at all faces so let's write down that and that's going to be the whole uh, the uh, let's call it some kappa prime because we're going to call the final thing kappa so i've got minus kappa prime do t by do z and tell me if i'm missing a sign z plus delta z plus kappa prime do t by do z at z it should be the other way around right saumya so, where are you when i need you is it minus or plus let's do it carefully so like if it's entering here the heat flux is entering here and leaving here that's what we are going to denote it as so it's going to be at z plus delta z it's going to come in with the minus do t by do z correct and a plus here i think i'm missing it let me check my notes is that the way around that the way around okay so this is the thing so it's k plus it's coming in the negative direction which is why the minus became a plus got it so it's minus delta uh, the minus do t by do z in that direction which is a plus do t by do z in this direction is that okay for everyone and that's why this happened and uh, this is times how much the surface area right which was delta x delta y correct so that's the uh, net heat flux in this direction and i can write similar terms for uh, delta y delta z and delta x delta delta z i can write similar terms for that very similar to this one in dt by dx x plus delta x and so on okay so i could write these terms and that will be equal to what is the accumulation of the heat which is rho into delta x delta y delta z that's the uh, um that's the ma that's the mass thing coming in and uh, delta x delta y delta z at z1 and t1 which used to be there with a minus sign plus rho delta x delta y delta z what i have missed out a temperature right temperature cp into temperature cp into temperature okay at z2 t2 and this is to be multiplied by delta t for the heat flux 
Okay, let's go over it once again. So heat flux in all the six phases is equal to the accumulation. And now I've written Z1 T1 and Z2 T2. Because this blob, we're moving with the yellow blob, which used to be at Z1 at time T1, and it's now at Z2 at time T2. So if I divide now throughout by delta T, what will this become? Hmm? Hmm? And we're taking rho and CP as constant. We're making our life easy by taking them as constant. What will this become? Hmm? Is a Lagrangian derivative, right? Go back on your notes. Like we said, it said Z1 T1, Z2 T2 minus Z1 T1 divided by delta T. So we move with the blob. So it's just the Lagrangian derivative in time. So we have rho CP dt by dt equal to, and now I'm dividing throughout by delta t and by delta x, delta y, delta z. So I'm going to get kappa prime, uh, and the kappa prime I'm taking as a constant, del square t. Agreed? With respect to z in the LHS, in this, it's at any z that it's at. So like anywhere from here to here is a z. So at any given time from z1 to z2, whatever be the z, it's going to be that, that z. Okay, like here just for convenience, I've drawn the delta t being big. So it came down, you know, much more, the whole thing came down, but that's just for convenience, for visual convenience. So wherever it is at any given time is the Z. That's where we are doing it. Okay, so we got this heat equation and I could do kappa prime plus rho by rho CP to be kappa. So I get the heat equation. Okay. And now I can non-dimensionalize it just because we talk non-dimensional. And what would I have to multiply it by? This thing has a dou temperature by dou t plus u dot grad temperature equal to kappa del square temperature. Okay, so I could pull out a velocity scale and a time scale for this one, a, a velocity scale and a length scale, I can pull out a time scale. And doing that, I can divide by this and I can write a non-dimensional thing, which I'm going to give you as homework. And you derive this and tell me what is this Peclet number? It's PE. How does it differ from the Reynolds number? We derived the Reynolds number yesterday. Can anyone do it now and tell me? somebody who didn't know it from before. Just choose any length scale and any velocity scale and divide. So like I've got this U and L, just any length scale and velocity scale. Okay, the question is take this equation, which is a dimensional equation. And in this dimensional equation, there are things with velocity, which is dimensional and some length scale, which is dimensional. And like with the, the velocity scale divided by the length scale will give me one over a time scale. So I can make this non-dimensional. So I can choose, for example, some temperature scale. And in this equation, the temperature scale doesn't matter. Like I could divide it by some dimensional temperature and the, that won't matter. But I can take the other terms, U, and, and, and choose something called U and something called L and non-dimensionalize it. If I non-dimensionalize it, I'll write the equation like this. So where kappa became replaced by 1 over Peclet number. So I'm asking you, what is Peclet number? Just do the non-dimensionalization and tell me. I'm studying fluid dynamics for the first time. Okay. So these terms are like new to me. Okay. You use it on Buckingham by, you know, like, when you like use those terms, you 
K uh, yesterday I told you it's the thermal diffusivity. K kappa prime is the thermal diffusivity, and we divided it by rho C P to get a quantity called kappa, which was in meter square per second. Yesterday we wrote it down. It is the thermal diffusivity. Yeah, its conductivity scaled appropriately makes the diffusivity. Okay. Okay, so if you do it right, you should get Pecli is equal to U L by kappa. How does that differ from the Reynolds? Kappa ke jagah new hai. That's it. So basically, it's also like a, it's like it behaves like a Reynolds number, except that we are now with a different diffusivity, which is slower or faster than momentum. Slower, so kappa is smaller. So for the same flow, uh, typically you'll have a higher Peclet number when you have a lower Reynolds number. So heat will be transported differently from momentum. Heat will be dissipated also differently from momentum. Okay, so that's the Peclet number. We can non-dimensionalize it like that. And now we could write the exact same equation for concentration as well. So, like if I started with some, uh, you know, like some little blob of ink, and then I'm following that, and I'm asking how much is it losing, like how much of fresh water is coming in, and how much ink is going out. The diffusivity will be exactly the same, and the equation will be exactly the same which will now be d concentration by dt is again a one over Peclet number. It's called again Peclet number, but it now has the other diffusivity in it. So it will diffuse even more slow. Yes, I didn't talk about what happens at the boundary. Yeah, so if I take the global, global heat balance, I, and then I have to draw those walls and write it like that. So, but that will indirectly influence this because the dt by dz will be determined by that. So, that's all. Locally, this is always valid. Got it? And if I'm doing mass diffusivity, like I put some ink, red ink in the coffee, then uh, that won't leave the boundaries. So, I'll have, that problem will then change. It's just the equation which is the same. So, there's many differences between temperature and uh, these things because the mass A, the diffusivity, the Peclet number is very different. So let's call this Peclet for the mass diffusivity. It's not the same Peclet number. So that's what is going to be happening here. Okay, uh, shall we work out an example in this? Okay. Example. 
So I'll first write your homework so that you get Josh to listen to the example. So there is a spherical flower in the middle of nowhere and it's giving out scent. It's giving out fragrance of concentration C. So like there is, let's say a bee who is this distance away. Then when will the bee like start smelling the concentration? Suppose it can only smell if the concentration is above some threshold. Then how long will it take for the bee? At zero time, this flower bloomed and it's giving spherically symmetric concentration. And this thing has a connection to the spherically symmetric problem that Hrithik and uh, Rajarshi have solved and they'll show you in the experiment. So it will be a nice experiment where some more stuff will be happening. So that's your homework. But that's because I don't have to do it, right? So to make my life easy, I made it a 1D problem. So imagine there's an infinite wall like this. And at time equal to zero, like it's covered by creepers with flowers, like it's got flowers all over. And at time equal to zero, they bloom. So till then there was no concentration and at time equal to zero, they're blooming. So I want, to, I want you to tell me what's the concentration at some distance x. So in this problem, there's only x and time because the wall is infinite. Agreed? And I chose this example because there is this concept called similarity uh, transformation in fluid mech, which we use all the time. And I want to give this as an example. You'll see more and more and more complicated examples of the same thing. So let's write down the thing. And here there is no air or any wind blowing. It's all still. So in this equation, I've got to solve this equation now. What will I drop? Is there any way I can simplify it? Huh? Let's say x and y. It's only x direction. So y and z will drop. Y and z will be dropped. That's true. I've made it into a 1D plus time wala problem. It's still partial differential equation, but only two variables. Very good. What else can I do? We'll come to that. We'll come to that. Um, yeah, what else can I do here? Huh? Courier. I'm not even coming to that. I'm saying in the equation, can I drop any term? Huh? Exactly. I can drop the, I can re replace DC by DT as do C by dot. So my life becomes enormously simpler. Everybody agrees? What were you saying? Yeah, yeah. So I can drop that. You were saying the same thing. Okay. So we are left with, and I'll go back to the dimensional version just for fun. I've got do C by do T equal to kappa del square C by del X square. Agreed? And all the flowers opened at time equal to zero. So here C equal to C zero. Some C zero for all time after zero. Okay, it's a constant. And what's the concentration at infinity? Zero. So C is, so this is at X equal to X zero and C equal to zero at X tending to infinity. So this much I know. And now I want to solve this problem. So who said variable separable? Yeah, so you're right. Like the minute we see a partial differential equation, our gut instinct is to say it's variable separable because that's one thing we know how to do. And we immediately write it as a separate function of time and a separate function of x. And then we solve it. Yes? Why do you think it will not work? Because let's say we are saying that it's some function of time, let's say. Mm. Mm. So in just time, it should like uh, in, in in space also the smell is like decay, and in the time also it should decay. Yes. So the basic point is that right now everything is zero except the C zero. And then I'm going to get some profile. And that immediately tells me that it's not, I cannot multiply a constant by a function of time. Initially it was constant in space and it's not going to remain constant in space. So I cannot multiply by any, I cannot multiply a constant in space by a function of time and get anything. Yes. 
okay we dropped the term v dot grad c because there was no wind blowing that v is the velocity of the flow there is no flow everything is still and only the scent is diffusing only diffusion is happening okay so if we can't do variable separable the thing that we do all the time is this uh, similarity transformation so like what is the idea behind variable separable i'm taking a partial differential equation and i'm converting it to odes once i have odes i feel my life is easy and i can do that right so that's exactly what we want to do but we're going to do something different for that so we're saying this and and in fluid make the interesting thing is that whenever you have a thing called a similarity solution typically if the flow is laminar and in even in many situations where the flow is turbulent that similarity solution is a stable point it's an attractor so like once you get a similarity solution all nearby solutions will run into the similarity solution so the first thing we do is we ask can i make a similarity solution and with reasonable confidence i can say that that will be an attractor what is its basin boundary and all i won't know maybe it's only the tiniest one but at least it will be correct in some scenario so that's why we look for a similarity solution and a similarity solution aims at converting this to an ode so i'll choose a variable called eta in which i'm going to write the ode and this variable eta is x to the power of a t to the power uh, x to the power of b t to the t to the power of a x to the power of b okay like this is what i'm going to define so i'll put three lines because i defined it defined a quantity called eta so now i can convert my partial differential equation into an ode in the following way so i have do c by do t what will it be in terms of eta it will be d c by d eta into do eta by do t agree why did i write dc instead of do c by do eta yeah i'm hoping that it's only going to be a function of the eta so i'm writing it like that so and what is do eta by do t someone a into t to the power a minus 1 x to the power b is that correct okay so similarly let's do do c by do x do c by do x is do c by sorry d c by d eta into do eta by do x which is what somebody help d c by d eta b x to the b minus 1 times t to the a is that all yes but we need d square c right so let's do this one more time d square c by d eta square i'm sorry do square c by do x square that's the thing we want is b b into so wait first i'll write i'll i'll first copy this and take the derivative of that so i have uh, dc by d eta into the x derivative of this which is b into b minus 1 x to the power b minus 2 t to the power a i've left out something right plus d square c by d eta square into do eta by do x ka whole square which is nothing but this thing ka whole square agree b square x to the power b 2b minus 2 t to the power 2a is this correct is it correct yes okay so what we'll do now is put this back into that equation we're now looking for a similarity solution so we're going to put it back in this equation so i have kappa times this whole object 
plus is equal to this object. Agreed? So this is my LHS. And this whole thing multiplied by kappa is my RHS. Let's equate them. I have DC by D eta into A And what I'm going to do is, I remember that eta is t to the a x to the b. So I'm going to recognize that this is nothing but a times eta by t. Right? So right, I'll write a times eta by t because I want to write it in terms of eta as much as possible. That's what I'm aiming for. Equal to, what is this term now? dc by d eta times b, I'll keep it as b into b minus 1. I could do b square minus 1. And this is e, eta over x squared. Very good. And that's my first term. Plus d squared c by d eta squared times b square eta square by x square. Agreed? Now, what does this buy me? What was, what was I aiming for? An ODE, right? So, I don't want x's and t's there. I want only eta there. And But I have a handle on eta because eta is this. So, now it's my choice to choose a and b as I like. See if I can cancel them. In, in favor of an eta. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. So suppose I say eta is t to the power of half x. That's one way. So a is x, uh, a is half, b is one. I could choose other things, but I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll be writing a different ODE and I'll be in trouble. Like I could multiply all of them by some number. But I chose this very cleverly because I want to throw this term. If B is 1, I throw that term and make my life easy. So that goes. So what did I get now? X square by T is eta, right? Was this eta square? So I can take the T up there. And I can cancel out. 1 eta, right? Or can I cancel out both? Eta square is t by x squared. So the whole thing goes, right? The same as oh, wait, wait. Let's do it again. I had eta square by x squared, x squared times, t. times t. So t by x square is what? No, I should have got T in the numerator there. So I should choose X to the minus half, right? Yes. I should choose T to the minus half times X. So A is minus half and B is 1. Will that work? Hmm? Will this work? So I can throw away, I can cancel out this part. And B was 1, right? B is 1 and A is minus half. So what have I got in the end? I've got minus half eta dc by d eta plus d equal to, or I could take it to this side, plus d square c by d eta square equal to 0. Cool, right? So this is like what similarity transformation will buy you. Why is this name similarity? Because I'll get self-similar answers. So what I'll do is I'll solve it for one eta. I'll solve it for all the eta. I don't have to solve it for x separate, t separate. 
ओके सो एक बार आई सॉल्व इट फॉर ईटा आई सॉल्व इट फॉर एवरी एक्स बाय रूट टी राइट आई लेट मी राइट इट एज एक्स बाय रूट टी आई सॉल्व इट फॉर एवरी एक्स बाय रूट टी सो इफ आई कम एट अ लेटर टाइम आई गेट द सेम आंसर एक्सेप्ट आई स्केल इट बाय रूट टी I'll I'll be plotting it. I'll be plotting it. So this is the thing, right? What what order is this equation? First order, second order. But it's actually a first order equation in DC by d eta, right? It's only a first order equation, which I can solve directly. If I call DC by d eta equal to y, let's say, so it's a first order equation in y. You agree, right? So can somebody help me solve it, please? So I get y prime plus half eta y equal to zero. Hmm. Sorry, sorry. I should have brought the kappa here. Excellent. Somebody, please catch me on all this. In this itself, I should have had kappa and kappa. So where did the kappa go now? It goes into the y prime. Can somebody solve and get me the answer? Yeah, order. Order. So, like a double order. Because the degree is one. But the double double order differential equation. Yes. No, no. It's a double, it's a second order differential equation in C. But C doesn't appear in this equation. Only DC by D eta is appearing in this equation. We don't have the C wala term. So I'm making my life easy by calling DC by D eta as another thing called Y. I've just renamed it as y, okay. and now it's a first order equation in y, okay. which I can solve, which you can solve. So I'm waiting for you to give me the answer. Yeah, what is it? Sorry, Adi, but if that term existed, does that mean that there will be some kind of? <coughs> if the smell was like accelerating somehow, will that term exist there? Yes, there are various situations under which that term will exist. in which case you would have had a second order equation and you can still solve it more easily than you can solve a um, partial differential equation that's the only thing you 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 may not have succeeded in solving it but you've succeeded in making it an ode and then you can ask wolfram or somebody to solve it for you i mean if you plug in an ode into wolfram it will give you the answer right or chat gpt <laughs> They suck, right? Yeah. Thank you. Like, no, they they really do. I was doing like I I was out of practice of coding, so I mm. was taking their help, and they were not even considering one as a square number. So I had to teach it. That one is also a square number, and then it's like a child right now. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was like a child a week ago, so I don't know what the coders have <laughs> in a week, but they are not good right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I had a lot of trouble with ChatGPT also. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to make it do something for the logistic map, which I'll do next Tuesday, and uh, it finally solved the thing, and it gave me L equal to L. <laughs> I yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hmm. You are giving me the final answer. Why did you get a root t? Why will I get a root t? This is an ordinary differential equation in eta. I cannot get. Yeah, tell me the answer in eta first. Yes, tell me why as a function of eta, Baba. Tell me in e to the power something. 
e to the power minus eta square by 4 kappa. What? And yeah, like so it will be some uh, initial condition C prime 0. C prime of 0 times this. So this is the answer, right? And what will happen if I integrate it? What function will I get? Huh? I'll get error function, right? Basically, I'll get an error function solution, which I won't write down. But you can do this for yourself. So what we've got is some very nice expression for a very complicated looking partial differential equation. And we've solved this. Now I can integrate it once more because remember y is dc by d eta, right? That's why I still wanted it in eta because I want to integrate it once more before I put x's and t's. So like this is my thing, I can integrate it. If I integrate it, I'll get error function plus a constant. And that constant I know because I know that uh, at infinity, this is zero. So I know that constant and I can actually write this down in terms of error functions. So I've actually got the solution. So if you plot it and this is like a baby version of what uh, Rajashi and um, um, Ritwik will show you. We're going to solve the answer. How many of you in summer have used a mud pot to cool water? Not bad. Not bad. That's very nice to know because I asked my son this and he's saying, what mud pot? What will it do? <laughs> so I felt like I've left out something in his upbringing. <laughs> I have to bring a mud pot and keep it there. So I'm happy that many of you know. So why did you use it? To keep the water cool, right? So now like with this equation, you're unable to solve it. You're unable to solve for that problem. How did it make the water cool? Like diffusion. Yes, yes. So there's mass water vapor diffusing and there's temperature diffusing. So you can use both and they will help you. And they will even do the experiment for you. So yeah, it's going to be not a, as easy a problem as you think, but it's a nice thing which shows that you can do something. Okay, so... By the way, if the air doesn't, I mean, because we are not considering density of air at all, right? And I feel we are not considering it because even if there are less molecules, it will be molecules. Anyhow, just consider this room is vacuum and we are putting a perfume in that corner of the room and there is nothing to carry around. It won't reach there. So, so don't think vacuum, think air. Think care what you do because like we want density and everything to be a constant. We don't want to meddle with things. So think air now. Here's perfume and here's air. So what will perfume molecules do? They'll be intermingling in the air. And it's mass diffusivity, which is what I was waiting for somebody to tell me I'm making a mistake here. It is D, not kappa, which is slower than kappa. So everywhere I've written kappa. Make it D. I saw it a while ago, but then I thought I should wait for somebody to point it out. Okay. D and D. Okay. So this one is going to take time, Avantika, because the molecules of scent are actually going through the molecules of air. And scent can sometimes be a pretty complicated molecule. So it won't diffuse like very fast. Okay, flowers are also creating scent, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Of, I, mean, like I have seen the organic molecule there. There are molecules there as well. Yes. The yes. So yes. Both of them are similar. Yeah, yeah. It's the same problem. There's a complex molecule diffusing through air. That's why, like for flowers, you have to go pretty near and smell. Unless you're a bee, like if you're a bee, you're very sensitive. So here is a bee sitting. Here is a bee sitting. And it wants to smell a certain amount of concentration there. So what will happen? This is at time t equal to zero. You started with C0. So at t equal to zero, this was your concentration profile. 
and at a small time t this becomes your concentration profile and a bigger time t this becomes your concentration profile and so on okay so it will wait till some concentration is reached there so once it at that time it will know the flask there and start racing we've actually done these experiments in ncbs long ago we did these experiments in obed siddiqui's lab where the flies they kept looking at um, nose things right their whole problem was that right obed siddiqui you should know <laughs> yeah so yeah you can actually realize that insects can sense that and start walking so he had the flies in a tube so after a certain time a reasonable amount of scent will reach there and it will start walking towards the flower i'm changing the question i'm sorry i'm diverging no 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 you you're being useful uh, here though we can see that the diffusion can happen but if you put rice sorry not rice sugar there and if it must be very slow if it is happening because i can't imagine it happening but if and there is any ant in the room it will figure out and it will walk by it. exactly so it can sense a lower concentration than you can and the diffusion is happening there yeah so so our tea portion there it was hot liquid yes but it has the diffusion will happen even when it's air yes there's sugar particles are there yes okay because like sugar like some amount will come in gaseous form so then like the gaseous molecules of sugar will diffuse like anything else but that's not going to be so sensitive you're quite right that flower scent is much more smelly than sugar is this question i'm sorry yeah how this molecule in complex reduce its mass diffusion what is when we being complex what is it mean ah uh, okay okay so last time we had spoken about uh, big a big molecule will find it hard to walk through small molecules right so the more complex a molecule is it's a bigger and b it could have like a funny shape so oh no i rubbed out the one i wanted so um it so so let's say there was this big molecule and it was surrounded by a lot of small molecules and we decided last time that in order for this to go some great distance will be harder because every time it has to collide against many molecules and make a bigger gap for itself right we had studied this last time now suppose a molecule was very complex apart from being big so it has like water molecule is like a v shape right there's h h and o something like this and then there could be molecules with many sticks and things around like you know those aromatic molecules are pretty uh, aroma is scent right like scent molecules are pretty complicated so they could have like a very funny shape so you want a thing with many sticks and many such things it will go get caught in the other molecules right it won't be able to diffuse so easily so the more complex it is the harder it is to diffuse that's the answer to that question but meanwhile i rubbed out this so i'm going to put it back so this is what it looked like right now all these curves are exactly the same curve if you scale them properly if you rescale them properly do you understand that it's just a solution in eta okay so like i have one solution in eta which looks like this okay and eta was what x over root t correct x over root t so like suppose t was 1 and x was 5 that's going to be the same as t being 2 and x being root 5 is that correct 5 root 2 5 root 2 so every time like it's going to be the exact same curve right so based on one eta curve i can plot all the x x and t curves that's what my similarity is the shape is the same except it's getting stretched in x and squeezed maybe in in, in other problems it will get squeezed in the this direction also is this clear 
So that's why it's called similarity. Like it keeps the same shape, but it's not variable separable. The thing like is an ordinary differential equation in a thing where x and t are tied to each other in the form of x divided by root t. And when you get more and more familiar with diffusion problems, you know that there's a square root t random walk, so you don't get surprised by this x being, being related to root t. So there's a fundamental reason why it's coming like that. So we have about 10 minutes. What I'll do is I'll write down the Navier-Stokes and I'll tell one concept about the Navier-Stokes. Is that okay for all of you or are you tired? Okay, one thing about the Navier-Stokes. Okay, so where's the diffusion equation? We wrote down the diffusion equation like this, D temperature by DT equal to one over Peclet del square temperature, correct? And this is what happened to temperature. What, and, and remember like, this is because I didn't put a candle or something there. If I'd put a source of heat in the middle, like a room heater or something, then I'd have to add a source term, right? I'd have to add a source term. Now the Navier-Stokes is very, very similar to this, where the flow, instead of T, I'll put the flow, and the flow gets forced by something. Without the forcing, there is no flow. Okay, so that's what I'm going to write as the Navier-Stokes. So I'm going to write du by dt is 1 over Reynolds number this time because it is momentum diffusing and not heat, del square u, and minus some grad p. That's the forcing, gradient of pressure, like it's a unit force. So here, I have uh, brushed one very important thing under the carpet, which is that u is a vector, vector, and this thing is now like a tensorial quantity. And uh, I've assumed that I can write, you know, just a constant in front of it, just like I did for the other one. It's not quite that simple because there is, you know, strains and there is rotations and uh, the Navier-Stokes, uh, the, the forcing acts differently on these things. But uh, those I cannot do for you without spending a few hours on that derivation itself. So I'm asking you to accept that right now that it looks like this. It has a form like this. There's a question in chat asking about the previous problem. Mm. Uh, they're saying when we are dropping the V dot graph C, we are mm. assuming that the diffusion doesn't disturb the stagnant velocity. Correct. Thing? Correct. We are assuming that. And because the um, scent molecules are so very small, that they can't really create a you know major flow around. They will nudge the other you uh, the other uh, air molecules a little bit. They'll nudge them a bit, but there'll be no net velocity. So it, I mean it'll just walk past each other. That's all, and that's why we are differentiating diffusion from the continuum expression of a velocity. So what's happening here is on the molecular scale. Nothing will happen on the big scale. Okay, so we've just written down the Navier-Stokes. And there's just one fact about it I want to tell today and we'll continue from next time. And uh, the thing is that in a lot of the studies that we'll be doing, like in a lot of things where turbulence comes in, whenever turbulence comes in, what is high in this? The Reynolds, correct? So whenever your Reynolds becomes very, very high, then the whole flow becomes turbulent. And we're interested in understanding turbulence in this short course. There are other situations where the Reynolds is so very small and we'll be doing something completely else. So if the Reynolds is, and, and you know, as you go to Earth scale, like in a cloud, the Reynolds is 10 to the power 8. And it could be 10 to the power 8. I'm exaggerating, 10 to the power 7 at least. And then in Jupiter or something, it could be 10 to the power, I don't know, 13, 14, something. The big Jupiter vortex, it'll be very big. So like Reynolds becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. What would you want to do to simplify this equation? Hmm? What? 
drop out the first term on the right hand side right you will say like look anyway my answer is correct to three decimal places or something like why are you giving me a number which has got like 13 zeros in front of it or seven zeros in front of it so my first instinct will be drop out this viscosity term remember this is a viscosity term because viscosity comes in the numerator right so like if i say it's inviscid the flow is inviscid i can actually drop out this term so like today we're just going to spend a few minutes talking about when that's good and when that's bad okay so let us talk about a thing called singular perturbation so we're talking reynolds number much 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 greater than one and this becomes what's called a singular perturbation problem If we don't get this straight, we don't get uh, we don't get turbulence straight. So that's why I'm trying to tell you about this. So my first question, but perturbation in quantum mechanics we use it when like we are not able to solve equations. Are is it similar here as well, or is it something different? Okay, in fluid, make you use perturbation. The word perturbation in many different ways. Okay. The way we are using it here is not in the other way which we are going to use in the next class. Okay, in instability and all, we'll use it differently. Here I'll tell you what it means. Here I'll tell you what it means. So like, you might just say that, uh, let's work with an example, not even with this. Let me copy the example. It's called the Friedrich problem. Uh, I'll just copy it. I'm writing an equation, just a second order equation, plus F dot plus F equal to zero and two boundary conditions F zero equal to zero F one equal to one. We've taken this example and we'll see what the singular perturbation is. So like, um, just take this equation and uh, you just said, okay, like, let me drop the first term on the right hand side, correct? That's equivalent, and I'm telling you epsilon is minus 10 to the power minus 20, 10 to the power minus 50. So, like your gut instinct will be, let me drop it. It's just a perturbation on this solution. You've studied perturbation solutions, right? You'll say it's a small perturbation on the real solution. So, let me throw it. Okay, but this is not a regular perturbation. It's a singular perturbation, and I should not drop it somewhere. I should not drop it. I'll be making a big error. Why? Look at that example and tell me. It's not evident from the Navier stokes. I'm not saying look at the, I'm, I'm saying don't look at this problem. Look only at this problem, the toy problem, and tell me why I should not throw the epsilon term. It's 10 to the power minus 20 or something very slow, very small. It has something to do with that. Think harder and tell me. You're, you're, you're warm. There are two boundary conditions and we are neglecting the second order derivative. That's right. So basically, it's a second order equation. And if I throw away the first time, I'm making it a first order equation. And by making it a first order equation, I can't satisfy both the boundary conditions. It's as simple as that. If I want to satisfy both the boundary conditions, I have to keep it. And you're quite right. Like I can solve it exactly and I'll realize that the form itself is different. If I write it in the inner solution and the outer solution. I'm not going to do the whole singular perturbation theory in detail for you. Like uh, we could do that in another course another time. But uh, I'll just give you the broad idea. The broad idea is, okay, like, so it, it points to me that either at zero or at one, this term can become important. Maybe at both, but at least at one, this term can become important. And then, like, uh, why will it become important? How can it even become important when it's 10 to the power minus 20? Become important means as big as the other terms, right? Why will it become significant? Uh, 
f double prime so the only way it can become important is if f double prime becomes enormous which it will near one boundary or other and this is the whole concept of boundary layer theory this is the whole concept of boundary layer theory and boundary layers don't just appear in fluid mechanics they appear anywhere where you have an equation like this okay okay so near one boundary or other i'll get very very steep gradients in fact i plotted this answer i actually calculated it and plotted it for this and f0 is 0 and f final is f1 is 1 so it goes something like this and this layer have exaggerated its thickness it becomes smaller 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 as epsilon becomes smaller 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 but somewhere it becomes steeper and steeper so that the product is order 1 so in this layer however small the one over reynolds is i cannot throw viscosity away so this is a very very important feature of the navier stokes equation so i'll just give one teaser about what we'll do next time and stop okay so we will just put u the velocity equal to u potential that means u irrotational and u rotational we'll write it as a sum of these two things and the rotational one will be important in the viscous term and the potential one will be important elsewhere and we'll see how we can split the problem and study it sorry it is like a potential it is like any of those potentials you studied about but we'll see what it is next time okay so like we just doing some elementary simplification that we can and we'll study this next time and uh, we'll try to look at some kelvin helmholtz instability something about vortices things like that we'll do next time so that like you'll get an idea because turbulence is full of vortices so if you understand vortex and vorticity you can see something of what's going on in turbulence so we'll do that on tuesday any questions in the thing okay so shall we meet on tuesday then